Yo, yo, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Science of Flipping podcast. If you are watching this on YouTube, then you will see I'm with a very special guest who I'll introduce shortly. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify or any of the other platforms, uh, this is going to be a very special episode. You're wanting to stick around this whole entire time because I have a true baller on hand here. And so before we get started, as always, our key sponsor, MinutePages.com, for all of you looking for a professional website in the investor or agent space, go to MinutePages.com for affordable and incredibly professional websites that are SEO'd for you, MinutePages.com for that credibility, influence, and authority online. All right, I've said my piece. Now I get to introduce the man. Mr. Matt Larson is with us. What's up, brother? Hey, good to be here. Good. Well, so if you guys don't know Matt, he has an incredible story. He has done, God, how many deals have you done now over this oh, period? Man. We I stopped counting after like 4,000. So Shut up, baby. It's, it's a lot. Damn it. And I like to brag about like 2,300 and counting. And you're just like, ah, four grand, I'm done counting. So very uh, happy. He's a new friend of mine, just recently introduced. But I'll tell you, we just spent the better part of this morning already chopping it up. And I know we're going to be really, really close moving forward. And so you guys won't want to miss this episode. Stay with us. We are just going to chop it up in a way that, you know, kind of the OG professional real estate investors do. We just were talking about what you're doing in the real estate space right now and your thoughts of what's going to happen and your actions of what you're doing. Let's dive in a little bit about the economy and, and how you're taking action right now, kind of being contrarian to some extent to yeah. how most people are thinking. Talk to me about what you're up to. Well, so I, you know, I've been in real estate now for since 2005. So I got to experience the last real big bull, uh, bull rush, uh, and then saw the the massive downfall in 08, 9, 10. And that's where I really, you know, I made a lot of money. My portfolio, you know, by from 2005 to 2008, I had about 30 houses in my portfolio. I did a lot of fix and flip and wholesale in between there. But in 08, my portfolio went from 30 houses to 450 by 2013. Mm. So I, I made a ton of money during the last downturn. And, um, and then, you know, we, you know, obviously, I, I kept doing deals, I'm still doing deals very, very active, all the way through to now. But in 2021, well, let me back up, because in, in 2019 ish, I started I had this great big portfolio, when I say 450 houses, uh, that properties, I'm not talking doors, I'm talking I had apartment Oops. buildings, I had duplexes, fourplexes, triplexes, all How that many stuff. doors would you say, right? Because so the way I distinguish when I tell my students, I say roofs versus doors, right? Yeah. So because you can't say it's the same thing. So you had 400 it, it, roofs. It was, yeah, I would say it was probably around 520 doors Got total. It. Yeah, yeah. Because most of them were single family homes. That's kind of my specialty. So what happened was, um, you know, I built this great big portfolio, the market started to recover in 2000, what, 16, 17, 18. And I started thinking, okay, you know, we've, we've had a hell of a run here. We, you know, it's went from 08 to 2018. We've had 10 years of, of increase. Let's, let's start thinking about unwinding this thing. The old, you know, buy low, sell high. So yeah. I started selling off my portfolio. The problem is when you have 450 properties located in one main geographical area, you can crash the market yourself personally if you list them all at the same time. That's right. So my strategy was very simple. Just, you know, as tenants, um, as leases expire, you know, we have 20 something, 15 to 20 leases expiring a month or so. As those expire, just, you know, clean those houses up, list them for sale and then sell them. And so we did that between for the last four years, I, I sold off a lot of my portfolio. I sold off about 350 houses, which is, mm. which is great when it comes to, um, Your banking out. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of cash coming in, lots of closings, and not. And on the other side of things, during 15, 16, 17, in those years, I was buying 25, 30, and up to 40 houses a month. I'd always have 80 to 90 to 100 rehabs going. So all of a sudden, I got, I didn't have as much. You know how it, you know how it goes, Justin, when you're doing that many rehabs, you got a lot of outflow of cash to do the new products, uh, projects that you have coming in. Well, all of a sudden. Now I don't have the the new projects to the same scale because I started backing down my buy and hold side. I still did wholesaling, I still did fix and flip, but my buy and hold basically I turned off. Mm -hmm. So we started selling off all my rental properties 
And then all of a sudden, I'm getting I'm getting close to the end. I've I've got a hundred and something houses left, and then the I'm like I'm gonna make it. You know, I'm gonna sell these things at the absolute peak of the market and and capitalize on my profit. But then the interest rates hit, and that crashed the market momentarily. We didn't know how long it would crash the market. None of us really knew. We right. a lot of us thought maybe it was the beginning of the end again, but it wasn't. Um, the the inventory was was low enough that it didn't it. it it definitely corrected, but it didn't correct to the level we thought. So I switched my strategy quickly, went back to just buying, uh, buying fix and flip and wholesale. This is in 2021, 20, 22, still limited my, you know, my buy and hold, but we corrected again, went back. Yeah, up. we didn't, we really didn't crash, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't you ever use that for what happened, right? I mean, the reality no. is I, especially Miami, we just talked about it. We're still appreciating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We are appreciating in Miami. I understand yep. markets can be very specific, but you think, so did, did COVID impact your rental portfolio? And we did pretty good through COVID, but we still had the typical, you know, in the beginning we were collecting all the rent, you know, but as, as, as COVID wore on more and more tenants were like, Hey, I've got an opportunity here. He can't evict me. Let's stop paying. So we had, sure. you know, 15% of our por portfolio, stop paying rent and we had to evict those people and some of those people got a year's free rent you know that all that stuff happened but for the most part it helped because after it so so when covid hit and i told i was telling everybody i was going to do this when covid hit and the market crashed hard i bought about 80 homes in about 90 days there yeah you because the market crashed and yeah. you could pick them up for pennies on the dollar so then all of a sudden it dipped back up so we took those same homes that we just bought three months ago for for half of what they were worth. And and then we just fixed those up and resold those. So we did, we did capitalize on that too. But like I was saying, so so now, like you said, the market is still going up. So I'm still taking my portfolio and as tenants move out, we're cleaning them up and relisting them, selling them and selling them for a high price. And they're selling yeah. fast, you yeah. know, so. Now, what what is that cash, you know, injection? What does that do for where you're at in your business right now? Now, listen, for most of my listeners, Matt, right? Like we're talking to a lot of newbies, right? More mm -hmm. than not. Now, for those mm -hmm. that are not newbies in your experience, you're going to love this episode, right? We're talking, me and Matt have been around a long time. I've done it 15 years. Matt, you're 20 something, uh, right? No, eight, eight, going on 18 years. 18, yep. right? So yep. we have a lot of stuff we could talk about. So just bear with us if you're new. You're mm -hmm. going to want to be a part of these conversations. This is where you're going to want to get. But where does where does Matt go with this cash injection? What's mm -hmm. going to go on for Matt moving forward? So first of all, you you do have a tax penalty, right? When you're selling as many properties as what what I what I have been and what I always I've always paid a lot in taxes. You you will meet people that that pay no money in taxes. They have massive portfolios. They don't sell a lot. They refinance. That is a great tax strategy, and that's that's awesome. You want to keep your tax bill as low as you possibly can. Yeah. When you're doing what I'm doing, you will you will write a big check to the IRS. So you've got to sure. plan for that. Um, but then from there, it's just a it's a stockpile play. Okay. So my play is this. So just so everybody's like Matt's getting out of the real estate, that's not true. I'm just <laughs> I'm just trying to time the time the market, sell everything for the highest price because I got to experience that in 05 through 08. And then I saw what happened to prices from 08, you know, through 2010, and they just chopped in half. So, so what I want to do is I want to reproduce what I did in 08 to two, from 2008 to 2013. I want to do again. Now, will the market crash that hard again? Who, who knows? It might not. And I might, I might mess up, you know, a little bit and not capitalize as much as I could. Maybe the market doesn't fall at all for the next 10 years it's a gamble. There's a little bit of a risk there, but, but like I always tell people is listen, how much of a risk are you taking? If you buy a house for 50 grand and sell it for 150,000, right? You've got, I mean, you're making right. money. So I, I, obviously I wouldn't be writing the check to the IRS if I wasn't making money. So and that's a um, big boy check, buddy. So yeah, those are big checks. Those are Lamborghini. You know, I could have a fleet of Lamborghinis with the, I was just going to say, you're probably North in the seven figures when, when you're selling 400, yep. 300 and something rentals. I mean, you're up there. Yes. Buddy. So, so, um, so my play, my play next is right now, I, I listen, I just follow what the market's doing. I give the market what it wants. Right now, the market wants uh, you know, single family homes that are ready to move into that um 
that because the market doesn't have inventory. So if the market doesn't have inventory, give the market what it wants. Give it right. inventory. So I'm giving the market inventory. I'm going to run that through as long as I can until the market shifts. And if, if it crashes, then I'm just going to repeat process that I did put from 2008 to 2013. And I'm, but I'm going to do it bigger this time. I want to go 10 X, you know, so we're so just, what is, let's just say, you, so I've been fortunate enough is the word I'll use to be able to be, we just talked about a mastermind. I mean, I'm sitting around and, and obviously encourage you to, to be with me on the next one, but I'm, I've had the blessing to sit in some closed rooms with some really like hedge fund managers, right? Some really mm -hmm. high level. I'm not talking about good investors. I'm talking about people who, you know, have a B in their bank account, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they are hell bent. Like they are ready. They have a lot of dry powder. If the market even dips a little, they are coming in full steam ahead, right? And mm -hmm. so in my, they don't believe we, they, well, let me put it this way. They believe we are at the bottom. They said, this is it. We are done. Like, mm. even if interest rates go up another point or even two, we're mm. not going to have this catastrophic fall off because we are sitting here. We are ready. It will not happen. 2008 is not going to happen again. We have billions to spend specifically in the single family space, which is a little more unique now, right? A lot of the REITs and the hedge funds and whatever have gone after the multifamily. They're like, no, no, no. We're going heavily into the single family. So I tend to trust them, right? I tend to fall mm -hmm money, especially these individuals. Yep. And I'm seeing it myself in the properties we're buying. Like there is a lot of upside coming already. And so let's just say this, your assessment isn't right. And I'm not saying it is or isn't right. I'm just yep. saying, yep. what's your move there, right? Where you have multiple seven figures in the bank. Do you say, ah, I missed that one. I'm going to jump back in. Do you go after a different asset class? How would you pivot? I would... Um, let's say I'm wrong and it wouldn't be the first time, um, but uh, I would capitalize one on wholesaling as many properties to these big institutional buyers as I possibly could. I've already no I've done that play before. I'm pretty good at the wholesaling side because I'm good at marketing. And so we would just crush that game and then we'd start looking around to see what other asset classes are getting beat up. Right now, the retail space is getting beat up a little bit. If you look at the office space and a little bit of retail, it's getting beat up and they're, they are calling the big, the big money is calling for a big fall there. I've, I've done a little bit of, of that. I've never, I've never went all in on it, but I, sure. I flipped a Buffalo Wild Wings once for a $700,000 profit. That's cool. Um, I bought a lot of, in, in 2013, I bought $20 million worth of commercial property. That year I bought $20 million worth of residential and $20 million worth of commercial. So I made a lot of money in commercial before during the bottom when it went down. And I, I was wholesaling those buildings too. So I would, I'll, I'll jump back. I'll start looking around. If I'm wrong and the single family home thing goes up, then I'm just going to pay attention and see what else is getting beat up a little bit. Right, Cause if something's going up, they that. usually, yeah, mm -hmm. no. And, and listen, here's the highlight of why I asked that question. I hope you're, well, I don't know how I feel about your projection, right? Cause if I'm right, which I think the market is going to continue to appreciate, then I really win. But if I'm wrong and you're right and it does tank. Well, I'm just going to buy more. So I'm kind of right. kind of even different. I think we both right. could be right and win. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. But where I want to highlight this is a lot of the people that are in our space, they need to understand what you're talking about, which is being flexible, fluid, and adapting. So even if you make these assumptions, projections, you know, speculation of what can be happening, no one thought that we would rebound as fast as we did from COVID. No one even mm -hmm. understood what the hell was going to no. happen, right? Agreed. No one thought we would already be rebounding from the interest rate hikes. So the reason why Matt does as well as Matt does is the reason why I do as well as I do is because we're able to adapt on a dime. We're able mm -hmm. to try to look around that corner, take a look the best we can to see what is to come, and then make changes, adapt, change the little things, whether it's marketing, whether it's asset class, whether it's, you know, how we're acquiring. Maybe we get heavier into seller finance. Maybe we go into, you know, 200 door plus units. The point is being able to adapt allows Matt to do this for 18 years and make the amount of money he's made. It allows me to do it for 15 years, do what I've been able to do. That is the thing that I want to impress upon all you listeners. If you're watching here on YouTube, make sure that's a, a like button you're smashing right now because that's what creates the longevity, right? I just did a um, interview where someone asked like, 
retirement question or whatever. I'm like, I'm never retiring from real estate, like ever. Like it's no. just not gonna happen. It'll change shape for Matt and me, but dude, you're not retiring. You might start buying, you know, commercial buildings in downtown New York at some point. You know what I mean? Like, but that's I get really bored. Yeah, Say what? I get bored. Oh yeah, I get bored if we're sitting around. You got to like, I don't know about you. I got to have this thing working all the time. And if yeah. this thing's not working, then I'm not happy. I'm just like, you, you look at why doesn't Elon Musk retire? Why doesn't Jeff Bezos retire? Why doesn't you know all of these guys? Why don't they retire? Because they love what they're doing. They don't need the money. Um, yeah. It becomes, it becomes a, you know, uh, they want the game, you know, they want this working. And the best way you said it, the game, right? They, they love the game. How do we perfect it? How do I grow it? I mean, look at Elon. I mean, he has two of the largest companies between SpaceX and Tesla in general, right? You have mm -hmm. Bezos with Amazon and people, I think a lot of people still think Amazon is about selling products. It's all about AWS. It's all about their internet component. That's where they make a vast mm -hmm. majority. So those are the people that I would tell you, they all subscribe to the same thing Matt and I are saying, which is, you know, stay in the game long enough to win the game, right? I think the thing that just as a coach, I get discouraged when people get into our space and then like they quit after 30 days or 60 days. Mm. That's not the game, no. right? This is the long game, right? This is what can yep. create you a lot of income, but can create you a lot of wealth. Um, yep. And that is what's for sure. Now, before we get too much into it. I want to give a little brief background. I think you've hung out and done business with some rather cool people, in my opinion. Uh, a mutual friend, Dean Graciosi, you know him much better than I do. You've been with Dean and worked with Dean for years and years and years on the real estate and education space. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just recently found out you also did some coaching to uh, Tony Robbins, which I think yep. is pretty cool, right? Yeah. So I think you guys, listen, I try to give you the best of the best on my episode, on my podcast. And Matt, I can tell you right now is one of those guys. So where can people find you, Matt? So I have, you know, there's a million social media platforms. Now, the easiest thing to do is just go to my website and I have them posted right there on my website, which is just realestatematt.com. Um, if they go there, they can find me on, uh, they'll find my Facebook link and Instagram and all that. I used to give out my Instagram link, then it got hacked and I lost yeah. everything. That's right. Um, so now I just give my website and, uh, and, and that's the easiest way to find me. And if you message me, I just want everybody to know, like, I'm one of those guys that if, if you find me on social media and you message me, I do have a lot of VAs that work for me, but if a VA ever jumps in and message, they'll let you know that they're not me. They'll say, Hey, this is Sean for Matt's team. But if it's me, it's me. And I'm, I do answer most of my DMS. If somebody ever hits me up. Let's talk about VAs. I know you and I briefly talked about it um, earlier today, just about how your business really runs on a VA business model, which I think mm -hmm. is incredible. I, I'm actually one up until recently, I've really been opposed to VAs. I really mm -hmm. believe there's a lot of personal connection that happens in the real estate space um, that doesn't really connect. Talk to me about how you utilize VAs and then are they all like, you know, the traditional Philippines VAs or are you sourcing them from different yeah. sources? Yeah, so um, I hired my first VA in 2015. That VA still works for me today, um, but my whole team is VAs now. Um, I had an 18,000 square foot office uh, located in Davenport, Iowa, where I had um, 5,000 square feet of it was office space and 50 employees in that office. And the rest of it was my mini lows. We, we were just buying so many products that um, we started buying them direct to manufacturer and then we got a better deal. But in 2017, I sold 504 houses that year, um, 33 million in sales and only netted 1.8 million. Mm. And that woke me up a little bit because I was like, man, I just did a lot of deals and I only put 1.8 million in my pocket. And by the way, for you listeners that think that that's a lot of money, not compared to 33 million, it's not. It's That's right. a bad margin. And so, um, and so I, I've made a decision. I had a couple of VAs working for me. I made a decision like my, I'm paying well in high seven figures in, in labor in my office in these 50 employees. So I made a decision to, you know, organically as if people quit or got fired, I'm going to replace them with a VA. Took me about three years, three and a half years to do. But now my whole team is, is now VAs. They're all, and we are Filipino based. I do, I have my own VA company. Um, we source our own, we go direct to source. We do our own interviewing, our own in-house training, all that stuff. But everything from, you know, the typical cold caller texting lead gen side acquisitions is all VA. So when we get a lead, 
a VA lead manager takes that lead and determines if it's a good lead, bad lead. If it's a good lead, it hands off to an acquisitions VA. Acquisitions VA calls the seller, negotiates the deal. The lead manager gives a max offer price um, for what we can offer. Uh, so then the acquisitions uh, VA negotiates that deal. Once it's under contract, goes to a dispo VA. Uh, and we do the whole process start to finish. Zero of my – I do – there's two things I'm involved with with my wholesaling business. I do two meetings a week, one on Monday, one on Thursday. They're scheduled for 30 minutes. Typically, we're done in 20 to 25. Um, from there, I'm, Matt's not determining if it's, hey, this is a good lead. Matt's not determining, well, here's what we offer on this house. Matt's not determining, here's what we sell it for. I'm just there to lead the team. So the whole operation is run without me. So which brings me to the kind of like circling back to the original, why don't you retire why would I? I'm I don't right. have that much time invested every week into my wholesaling business. Are you still so, buying that many properties rapidly with VAs still? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in multiple markets. So we're in the Quad Cities. That's my main market. We're in Indianapolis. Um, so Quad Cities, Indianapolis, Detroit, Michigan. Um, we're in uh, Kansas City and a little bit into St. Louis. What are the Quad Cities? Davenport, Iowa. Moline, Illinois. So like John Deere's world headquarters is Moline, Illinois. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so in your main marketing strategy to find them, right? Because everyone wants to know what's the best way to find motivated sellers? What are you what are you currently doing? Mostly cold calling? Most. So if I had to pick one strategy only, this is like a good takeaway for, for everybody. The, if I had only one strategy to pick, it'd be cold calling. Okay. Um, but we do cold calling. We do texting. We do um, direct mail. Um, and then I'm doing some TV too. Uh, cool. We just started TV in October of last year, but it's it's worked out pretty good. I still think cold calling's better um, for the cost per lead and the cost per closed contract. Yeah. But um, but yeah, those are the main methods that we use. Yeah. So one of the things that I preach as as an educator is being dynamic. And so Matt, you're really highlighting this. Meaning, I don't. I hate when people say, oh, I'm just a wholesaler. I want to get into wholesaling. I get that. But you're really saying, I want to be a real estate investor. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just wholesale. You want to fix and flip. You want to buy long-term rentals. You want to be able to do short-term loans or notes, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And that's being dynamic. Simultaneously, what I'm talking about when I say it is be dynamic in how you find them. Don't just be a one-trick pony. Don't just do cold calling. Do text mm -hmm. messaging also. Do direct mail also. Do no door knocking. Do bandit signs. Do agent reach out. Don't just be a one trick pony on how you acquire yep. either. And don't be a one trick pony on how you exit it. And, you know, listen, I'm so happy you're saying these things. Uh, because this is what I find to be the drawback in our space is everyone talks about getting into the business and wholesale and you don't need money and you don't need you don't need money for fix and flips. How much money? Right. How much private money have you raised, Matt? In general, I, actually, I mean, just so, so I don't do a lot of private money, but what I do do is I, so, so I've always focused on my financials, right? My, my financials are strong. So I, I borrow hundred percent of the, the deal. When I do a deal, I get hundred percent of the financing from the bank. So it's, I've, I've exchanged private money for bank money, yeah. but they can, they close, they basically do what's called a, um, a guidance line of credit for me. Okay. And this again, guys, if you're brand new and you've net, you don't have any financials and you don't have cash in the bank and high net worth, this might not work for you. But it's just what I I wholesaled so much that I built up my income on my tax return to the point where in fix and flips to the point where the banks started saying, hey, if you want to borrow money, we'll we'll do 100 percent loans. And I was doing that all as far back as 2010, 11, when the market was crashed. And it's always about this. You're saying the same thing I am, whether it's private money or the bank relationship, it's the relationship. Mm -hmm. So most people getting into this business, even myself, 15 years later, I still use private individuals um, to grow the business, right? Um, yeah. And so, but your relationship with the bank started so early that now mm -hmm. the relationship is cemented and it gives you the ability to borrow all the money. You may or may not come out with the rehab funds out of your own pocket. Maybe you borrow that as well, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like my hard money lender, they will fund my rehab budget, yep. right? Because yep. of the history I have in the business. So essentially, I'm into this project for 10% of the ARV number. That's ultimately where I end up. Yep. So if I'm going to sell it for 
three hundred thousand. I only have thirty grand in this entire deal, and I might have done an eighty thousand dollar rehab, right? Mm -hmm. So I say that all to say I want people to understand you don't need your own money to do this. No, you may need to borrow money from people, not banks, in the way Matt does. But Matt's doing the same thing. I'm preaching to you guys mm -hmm. is get into the space of real estate investing because the money is out there when you have the deals. As you grow your portfolio, you grow your income, you become financially stable, if you will, then yeah, you're going to have bank relationships that similar yeah. to Matt. Yeah. And the other thing too, I've done this, stra I've done strategies before where I partnered with people yeah. that had money. That's right. So I might not have done private money, but I partnered up with them. They had cash. We split the deal 50, 50, they put up the money. I found the deal and, and put the rehab teams together and we split the deal 50, 50. You can do that forever and not put a penny of your own money into the deal. That's a, it's a good strategy too. If you can't find a lot of times people, there's a lot of private money out there. There's more private money out there right now than it's probably ever have been, but there's a lot of partnership strategies that you can't use the, you can't use the excuse that there's no money. You don't have money to not do really, you can't use it. It's just, there's too much other money out there. If you can locate the deal, That's you everything. don't ever have to have the, the 50, 100, 200, 300,000 to buy the house. Yep. That's it. I have a great point because I have a student that was going to do this flip himself. He's terrified. It's his first deal. I said, listen, the numbers make sense. I'll come into this deal with you. It will be my money. You don't have to bring a dollar. You don't have to be scared. I'll find the contractors. You'll be my partner. You'll see the whole thing. And that way you don't have to take on this massive risk because it was going to be, you know, this one I think is an 80,000 or so rehab, but mm -hmm. like he's going to have to get a lot of money for this. Yep. But now he's able to do this deal with none of his own money, my expertise, and we can share in the revenue, right? So there's always mm -hmm. money out there. So it is a always. great example of that because he yeah. found the deal. I coached him how to find the deal. He did what I told him and coached him to do. And then now he's able to do a bigger flip because of what you just said, right? Yeah. And the, the other thing too, Justin, when you get to guys that, that are doing the kind of volume we're doing, you know, 10 million in cash, you can burn that in fast. <laughs> you could burn that in, in, in six months to a year if you're moving quick. Yeah. You know, yep. it doesn't take long. <laughs> Not at all. Well, got Matt, listen, for the sake of time, um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, again, go to, is it realestatemat.com? Yep. Realestatemat.com. Make sure to reach out to him. He's the real deal. Uh, you know, I know that we're going to get closer and closer here in months to come here, dude. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Hopefully, right guys, here. you guys got a lot out of this. This is the high-level conversation I want all of you listeners to be getting towards, right, with some people that have done this for quite some time and done thousands and thousands of deals. So if you like this one, you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, make sure you give a five-star review. Matt, I appreciate you, baller. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Later.